You're my, 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 my,
Hello and welcome to Let's Talk with Bishop R.C. Blakes. R.C. is an author, empowerment teacher and the proud pastor of the New Home Ministries of New Orleans, Louisiana and Houston, Texas. His message circles the globe. His conversational and candid approach to challenging content makes him a relevant voice to all generations. Get ready for a life-changing transformational conversation. Hello, hello, hello. This is R.C. Blakes, and I want to welcome you back to Let's Talk with R.C. Blakes. And we are continuing our discussions on my latest book, Me, My, Mine. Um, there are nine chapters in this book, and we're in chapter number seven, where we're discussing, and I'm just kind of giving you an overview uh, we're discussing the mental games that narcissists play. And I think play is an excellent word because for a narcissist, a relationship is absolutely a game. You know, while, while you're taking things very seriously, for them it's nothing but... Um, it's nothing but a game. You know, the most confusing predicament one might find themselves in is being in a relationship with a narcissist. Even a casual encounter with a narcissist can prove to be puzzling, you know, at, at the least. Uh, while the sincere and good-intentioned individual is approaching the connection, the situation from an honest and pur purposeful place, the narcissist is approaching it from the perspective of a game. Confusing others is what I write in this book. Confusing others is the entertainment of the narcissist. So when you're dealing with a narcissist, they, they leave you feeling puzzled. They leave you feeling uh, confused. And quite often you get consumed in the confusion, and that is not by mistake. That is by design. Because for a normal, well-adjusted individual, a relationship is an opportunity to give as much, you know, as one will receive. For a narcissist, the focus is to take as much as one can. It's an opportunity to deceive and to trick and to manage, manipulate other individuals. Now, um, everything with the narcissist is about uh, getting. It's never about get, it's never about giving, it's never about sharing. It's always about their gain. If there are no gains in it for them, they don't want to play. Now, the Bible records an incident that depicts how, uh, somewhat how the process often goes. If you go to Genesis chapter number three, verses one through five, it reads like this. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And, you know, I teach that I believe that Satan is the, is the father of narcissists. And, you know, when you read the book, you'll understand why I take that position. It says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So now, if you, if you read, let me just read from the book so I don't miss anything. If you read the full context of this text, you know, the verses uh, before especially, 
and even the ones after. You read the full context of this text, you see how the serpent took the instructions that God gave to Adam and Eve and twisted them to such a degree that both Adam and Eve became confused. When Satan completed his mission, he talked Adam and Eve out of their place of dominion, confusion, games, narcissist play. Their entertainment is your confusion. He also, Satan that is, also destroyed their fellowship with God. Satan robbed them of their abundance and he wrecked their connection to God. I believe that this represents two outcomes when encountering and entertaining a narcissist. When narcissists are done, they may leave the victim depleted emotionally and their vital relationships may be in shambles. They will break your bank and they will destroy your connection to your vital relationships, people that really matter in your life. The narcissist plays games to destroy those relationships, to see how severely he or she may destroy them, how quickly they may destroy them. But notice how Satan produced all of this wreckage through a calculated conversation. It's because talking with a narcissist is like trying to grasp a balloon in the rain that has been dipped in oil. It's a game. It will wear you out and you will never seem to make a solid connection. Some of you are dealing with narcissists right now and you're trying to figure out exactly where they really stand, what they really mean and you know, uh, you've been talking to them for a while and you know no more about them today than you did three months ago when you first met this individual. A conversation with the narcissist can feel like a migraine headache. It's because they are intentionally confusing you, puzzling you, deceiving you. Now, according to psychologists, because of some early trauma in most cases, the soul of the narcissist is deficient of empathy. In other words, they cannot feel your position nor seek to ever understand you. They don't care anything about how you feel or what position you're in. If you look in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, where it, say, where it says this, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now, this text is interesting because when you're dealing with a narcissist, though they may have grown physically, they may be highly educated, they may be professionally accomplished even. They are still arrested in their emotional development, which is reflected in their lack of interpersonal skills. When they should be at a certain level, they're not there. What you would expect of someone in their position at their age, they do not possess. They cannot produce. It is because they are as arrested little mischievous children that are constantly playing games to twist you out of your will and into theirs. Now let's shift here. Some of the tactics of narcissists, and I'm on page 124 of the book, uh, some of the tactics of narcissists. Letter A, they will declare their love for you and never follow up with action. They will declare how much they love you and you will never see any action put to it. It's because they are excellent with words, but they're pitiful 
on follow through. Why is this? It's because they never intended on following through. They will just use the words, I love you, I adore you, and all of these things, and never apply action. It's because they simply want to get a hook in your emotions. And whatever they need to say to you to get you to believe that they are what you need, what you desire, what you've been praying for, they will say that thing. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, it says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth, because narcissists will love in word, in tongue, but never in truth, never in action. A narcissist is rarely guilty of action over talk. They will talk, 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 but they are rarely guilty of more action than talk. Now let it be uh, some of the tactics of narcissists. They treat you like they hate you. They start off with uh, declaring their love for you, never following through, and then, you know, they build you up to believe they love you so much, and then once you uh, buy in, take a bite of that big lie, then they begin to treat you like they hate you. Let me read here. One of the most puzzling experiences is when the narcissist goes from declarations of love to actually treating you like they hate you. After you have invested your heart and soul into the relationship, the narcissist may suddenly treat you as though you are nothing. They may treat you so poorly that you could actually begin to believe that you must deserve such treatment. It will seem to come out of nowhere. It will blindside you. Now, the root of the issue is not their hatred for you. It's really a personal issue within themselves. Their apparent hatred for others is the impact of something very complicated happening in their own soul. They don't really hate you. They hate themselves. Now, um, the narcissist has a self-disdain that causes them to function antagonistically toward those persons in proximity, who's ever close. They hate themselves and will use others as their emotional punching bags. They hate themselves even when they're not aware that they hate themselves. In Titus chapter 1 and 15, it says, Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. A person's external perception and analysis of matters cannot transcend, listen to this, the level of their internal settings. A person cannot give what they don't possess, and they cannot manage the external world and their relationships beyond their self-view. For instance, if I hate myself, it's impossible for me to truly accept the idea that you love me. Because I can't fathom loving myself. So when a person's heart has been darkened so severely, their entire worldview becomes tainted. And so it's not really you that they're hating as much as it is they hate themselves. Now, they think it's a hatred of you. They think it's a manipulative tactic, but the reality is there's a, there's a self-disdain. Let her see tactics of the narcissist. They will humiliate you. They will humiliate you. Another common experience one might have in a marriage, for instance, with a narcissist is the feeling of humiliation. 
They, they will do everything possible to break your confidence and diminish you in the eyes of people, especially the people that you revere or the people you respect highly. They will humiliate you before your family, before your friends, co-workers, you know, anybody that you view as important. Now, um, the worst experience is when they humiliate you and behave as if they don't know what they've done. They humiliate you and then they act like they don't know. Oh, I, I didn't know. I didn't know. Oh, I didn't know you felt that way about it. Come on, man. You knew what you were doing. You know, I, I, guess, I guess we could call this passive humiliation. You know, when they humiliate you and they're smiling and laughing like they don't, they don't really know that this joke is uh, injuring you. They know exactly what they're doing. Now, uh, let's see something here. Uh, that letter, letter C, they will humiliate you. Um, well, narcissists humiliate others because they need to diminish the other person to elevate themselves. That's how they elevate themselves, by diminishing, by diminishing you. Revelation 12 and 10 says, And I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused our brethren before God day and night. It's because they humiliate you. They do whatever they can to humiliate you. Letter D, they apologize profusely, but nothing ever changes. Nobody can beat a narcissist apologizing. Oh my God, especially when you get to a point where you're fed up and you've had enough and they really feel like you mean it this time. Oh, they can apologize. They can apologize. They apologize you back into the clutches. They apologize you back into back into their clutches. Nobody can nobody can destroy you like a narcissist and nobody can pull you back in like a narcissist. Man, they can apologize. They can break your heart. They can humiliate you. They can defame you. They can demean you. They can diminish you. They can deplete you. And when they get through apologizing, man, you feel sorry that you ever acted like you wanted to be away from them. But the, the problem with the apology of the narcissist is that it is a well-articulated lie. It's a well-articulated lie. They're not going to change. They don't mean what they said. They're not sorry that they did whatever they did to you. They did it on purpose, and it, had, it accomplished the desired impact. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and 10, it says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. In other words, when a person is really sorry, they repent. Meaning what? They turn around and they do the opposite of what they did. It's not just a whole lot of words. It's not, a, it's not just a lot of uh, verbiage. You know, it's, it's more of a turning of the behavior than it is a churning of the vocal cords. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just words. You know what I mean? Now, letter E. When you begin to pull away, they make you feel guilty and accuse you of abandoning them. So if you don't accept their apology and get back into the web, then they accuse you of abandoning them. Can't believe you. I can't believe you leaving me out here. Uh, you know, after all I did for you, I make one mistake and, 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 and you done with me. What kind of person are you to abandon me like this when you know how much I love you? Some of you have heard that kind of craziness. 
Well, the person may realize that the relationship is futile and uh, even lose their attraction to the narcissist. But when they pull away to break free, another web the narcissist will spin to trap the victim is the web of guilt. And I say it all the time. Anybody that makes you feel bad should not have a place in your life. Guilt is a low vibrational energy. It's, it's a low vibrational frequency. Anybody that's constantly trying to use guilt is a bottom feeder and a, a low vibrational individual that will produce nothing but negative consequences in your life. Because people that are, you know, that mean you well and come from God, they're not, they're not functioning. They're not trying to manipulate you through guilt. They love you through truth. The narcissist may go as far as to launch a social media campaign, painting themselves as having been abandoned by someone they trusted, knowing full well that everybody that's connected to you that reads it knows exactly who they're talking about. They, they will send confusing text messages like, how could you do this to me? All of this is to make you feel bad. And the reality may be that they physically assaulted you. They drain your bank accounts, but somehow you are doing this to them. They will often resort to threats of suicide even. If you don't, if, if, if you don't come back and if, if you don't want me, I'm going to commit suicide. Hmm. All of this to what? Spin that web of guilt to trap you all over again. All of this to guilt the victim into submission, but do not fall for it. Now, uh, here are some of the classic narcissistic abuse tactics that, you know, all of the um, mental health professionals discuss, love bombing. You know, that's basically when they, you know, they just, man, they just do everything, say everything, and they just bomb you, bomb you, bomb you with acts of love. You know, they figure out whatever your love language is and they bomb you with that, bomb you with that. If it's words of adoration, man, they flatter you to no end. If it's uh, acts of service, man, they'll pick up, they'll walk the dog, pick up the kid, man, clean the dishes. If it's, you know, words of affirmation, you know, uh, you know, a gift, gift, gift giving or whatever, man, they keep you loaded up with flowers and candy and presents and all of this kind of stuff, love bombing you. Well, you know, all of the acts are nice, but they're, they're not sincere. They're intended to impress you and to impress you to the point that you let down your guard. And then when, you know, after they've love bombed you into submission, then they revert right back to the individual that you've always known them to be. Because love bombing is the intentional process of creating an emotional addiction in a victim. The purpose of love bombing is to turn your emotions up high to dull your intelligence and your spiritual discernment. Love bombing feels great until it doesn't. When the smoke from the love bomb clears, the reality of bondage and entrapment appears. The narcissist can act good enough, long enough, to get you emotionally addicted. After the addiction, comes the what? Withdrawals. And then you have the classic um, tactic of hoovering. Now, the term hoovering is named after the Hoover vacuum cleaner. If you're from my era, you know about Hoover vacuum cleaners. It speaks of how the narcissistic abuser finds a way to keep sucking the victim back into the trap. Whenever there's a breakup with a narcissist, 
They are plotting how they may re-enter the victim's life again when it's beneficial to them. They go away, but they never go away. They're always plotting on how they're going to get back into your life. And there's a point where they begin to hoover. Every time a narcissist is successful with hoovering, the victim is being more severely damaged and is less likely to move on to another healthier relationship. Every time you let a narcissist back in, the bondage gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45, it talks about how when, you know, an unclean spirit is, is cast out, uh, it comes back and hoovers. Let me read it for you. It says in Matthew 12, 43 through 45, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth, uh, findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So if you succumb to the hoovering, uh, the narcissist is going to leave you in a worse condition than before. And then you have ghosting. And ghosting is when uh, the narcissist suddenly disappears from the life of the person they are in a relationship with for no apparent reason. The purpose of ghosting is to break the confidence and independence of the victim because ghosting does severe uh, emotional and even psychological damage. And then you have, none of, and these are not in sequential order, if there is such a thing as sequential order. Then you have gaslighting. Gaslighting is a tactic in which a person or entity, in order to gain power, makes a victim question their reality and sanity. The narcissist does things intentionally gauged to drive the victim insane. The purpose of gaslighting is to create an environment uh, with enormous inner confusion within the individual about what's true or what's false. And then you have triangulation. Tri triangulation is when the narcissist positions between two parties to control the narrative. The narcissist will feed calculated information to each party with the explicit intention of being the puppet master of both. The narcissist will create doubts in each about the other and paint themselves as the go-to person for both. They simply triangulate. Then you have the, the game that the narcissist plays called Flying Monkeys. And this is where um, the narcissist uses other people in your sphere or in your circle, uses them many times without them knowing it, to fly back into your life, to bring their message, and to do the emotional damage that they would do themselves. They send these flying monkeys. Sometimes they use your family, your friends as flying monkeys. You know, you, you, they, you tell, you tell your, friend, your friends you're done with this individual, and the narcissist will call them and give them a whole line, and then the friends will bring that stuff back to you, and that same spirit will re-enter your life through the flying monkeys called your friends. So those are, uh, that's some of the, the mental games that narcissists play. I know it's a lot. In, in, in chapter eight, we're going to talk about an exit strategy from a narcissist. This is when it gets really, really good. So I hope you've been blessed today. Now, listen, don't forget to go by the website, check out uh, all of my online programs, sign up for my mailing list, go to Amazon, pick up the actual book, Me, My, Mind. It's there in physical form, in audible and in uh, ebook form. So go to Amazon now and pick up the book. Um, if you need counseling within the description, there's a link for BetterHelp Counseling. 
you use the link and you, you like what they offer, the link will afford you 10% off of the cost of their counseling and they in turn will make a deposit into R.C. Blake's because I referred them to you. I want to thank all of you that always sow it into Lisa and I and support our ministry. We love, 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 love you so much. Now, until next time, I'm R.C. Blake saying to you, you're on top and you're going high. Your God has more in store for you. So we will see you at the top. In the meantime, go and pick this up at Amazon. Hope you've been blessed today. Until next time. We here at R.C. Blake's Ministries want to thank you for spending this time with us today. R.C. and Lisa are always honored to have you with us. Don't forget to reach out to us by visiting our website at www.rcblakes.com. While you're there, you may join our mailing list and receive a free download of the Laws of Manifesting Your Vision by R.C. Blakes. Also look at all of the online programs by R.C. You may find all books written by R.C. and Lisa. Once again, all of us here at R.C. Blake's Ministries want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And as we always say, see you at the top.